Today we're going to interview Dr. Evan Alexander here at Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where we are gathered to celebrate his 80th birthday. All of the former residents have returned to Winston-Salem for this occasion, and while we're here, we're going to interview him for the American Association of Neurological Surgeons Leadership Series. Dr. Alexander was the head of the department and was professor of neurological surgery at the Bowman Gray School of Medicine in Wake Forest University from 1949 to 1977. In addition, he was editor of the Journal of Neurosurgery and still serves as editor of Surgical Neurology. Dr. Alexander also served as the executive officer for the North Carolina Baptist Hospital for 25 years. He has served as the president of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and has been president of the Society of Neurological Surgeons. Also, he was president of the Academy of Neurological Surgeons. Dr. Alexander has been active in neurosurgery all of his life and has, been, uh, has served in many in various capacities in other organizations. Dr. Alexander was born 80 years ago. He was born in Knoxville, Tennessee. His father was a physician. Uh, Dr. Alexander, when was the first time that you gave serious consideration to becoming a physician? I was a, a son of a surgeon and I admired my father a great deal. I enjoyed what he did. He took me to the operating room. He took me to various house calls and things of that sort. And I believe I sort of thought I'd be a physician always. Uh, he f felt I should probably be a minister in the Presbyterian Church. And uh, in fact, when I had pneumonia and almost uh, died, he uh, promised the Lord that I would be a Presbyterian minister. So that's been a kind of a disappointment to him. But uh, I did. Uh, as soon as I began to think of life seriously around 13, 14, that was really what I wanted to do all the time. Well, what type of education did you have during those early years? Were you in a private school in Knoxville or did you go away to boarding school? I, I was in a private school, but a very indifferent student. And uh, it was only when I went away to boarding school at Macaulay in Chattanooga that I began to take it seriously. And part of that was related to the fact that they had a very strict uh, disciplinary system that if you didn't finish your work each week, you'd spend Saturday afternoon and even, in fact, Sunday doing it. And, and it took me about three weeks to learn that that was a rather poor arrangement. And uh, so I began to study seriously and uh, uh, rather assiduously from then on. And uh, from uh, high school in, Ch uh, in Tennessee, where did you go to uh, undergraduate work? Well, I graduated twice at Macaulay because the first time I graduated at 16, I was only 5 feet 2 and weighed 110 pounds, and my voice hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. So uh, my father just said, I better go back to school because it would be embarrassing to go to college like that. And so I graduated a second time and then went to University of North Carolina. What uh, type of curriculum did you take when you were at University of North at Carolina? At University of North Carolina, I took a, a strong... Uh, a course in the humanities. I took Greek my all four years there because my grandfather had been a professor of Greek. Uh, I took a, a good deal of English literature and uh, for German and everybody said if you don't know German you never can learn medicine. That was based before World War II. And then I concentrated on zoology and chemistry and took those uh, very uh, assiduously. That was my major and my minor. and. Uh, that was most of my senior year. From there you went to medical school? Uh, I went to Harvard Medical School from there and uh, uh, that was a four-year school. I did not want to go to a two-year school they had at Chapel Hill. It was a good school but I just wanted to go to Harvard and I did. And uh, when you were at Harvard Medical School did you have any preference for one specialty or another or were you just interested in all phases of medicine? Well, I was interested in all phases of medicine. I rather thought I might be an obstetrician. And in fact, uh, I won a, a contest uh, to be a, a student uh, obstetrician at the Florence Crittenden home for three months and delivered 30 primipro babies during that time. But uh, then I began to uh, be uh, more concentrating in surgery. So I took a surgical internship 
at the Brigham and Women's and Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. And at that time, that was a uh, 29 months internship. You had one month vacation, and uh, you were paid $10 a month, and uh, uniforms and room. No, not almost none of us were married. And uh, at the end of that time, I was intent on being a surgeon. Did you spend some time at, in New York as an intern? I spent some time uh, as an intern, a uh, student intern at the Roosevelt Hospital, uh, and I liked it. But I was so intent on uh, pursuing a, an academic career that I did not want to leave uh, the academic environment and went back to Boston. Did you uh, do postgraduate work at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital? Yes, I did. The Peter Bent Brigham and Children's Hospital was a combined surgical uh, tra training program. And I, I spent 29 months there altogether. And were you doing neurosurgical training at that time? Uh, I was doing neurosurgical training only in the sense that you rotated through neurosurgery. And I liked that. But what really uh, uh, fortuitously caught me was that uh, when the war came along, uh, uh, we didn't quite know what was going to happen to most of us. And uh, Dr. Ladd, who was the head of, head of general surgery at the Children's Hospital, offered me his residency in children's surgery. And uh, I accepted it, but there was a uh, six months wait before the present resident would be out. And uh, at that time, Dr. Frank Ingram had an opening in his program, so I served as Dr. Ingram's uh, uh, assistant resident during that six months, and that's how I started neurosurgery and never finished, never, never left it off. Uh, how, how long a period of time did you spend in neurosurgical training with, uh, at, the, at the Brigham? Well, I was with... Uh, Dr. Ingram for six months, so altogether I was at the Brigham Children's about three years, a little over three years. And uh, then I went into the service where I stayed over four years. And during that time I was first assigned as a surgeon uh, in a station hospital in Texas. But uh, my efforts were devoted towards getting back into neurosurgery, which I finally was able to do. Uh, and then uh, uh, I was assigned to eventually to a uh, uh, evacuation hospital that went to New Guinea, where I was the neurosurgeon. Uh, did you see a great deal of combat action in, in New Guinea? No, I did not. Uh, I saw some about what you'd see in civilian practice. Uh, the Japanese uh, fought like uh, uh, tigers uh, when you first went into an island, but. That only lasted about a day, and then they faded off into the woods. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we spent most of our time protecting ourselves at night when they'd send a plane over bombing and uh, relaxing during the day. Uh, so it was not a lot of surgical experience until uh, we got to, New Gu to uh, Mindanao, which is in the Philippines. And that was a pretty strenuous campaign right up the center of the island and it uh, lasted about a month, a month and a half. Earlier you mentioned that you did see some machete-type injuries to the cranial cavity. Did, were those well, the... I saw machete-type injuries, but they were mostly native-on-native -native, mm -hmm. uh, Filipinos. And, uh, so these machete wounds were very clean, uh, sharp wounds. They went right through the scalp and the skull and down into the brain about a centimeter or so. And I didn't realize how clean they were. As a matter of fact, I explored them but when I was finished, I realized that they were nice, clean incisions and uh, uh, didn't have much trouble with them. Uh, <clears throat> were you uh, exposed to any tropical diseases while you were in the South Pacific? Or what's we that had problem? malaria, and uh, all my tent mates uh, developed malaria, but we took Atabrine, and every time we, uh, if one of them had a chill, I took another pill, and I never did have any chills and never was aware I had malaria. Uh, the adabrine turns your skin kind of a sickly tan, uh, and uh, so I was able to get some some exposure to the sun that way, which I never could before because I had such fair skin. When you uh, finished with your military service, uh, did you uh, still 
have uh, some more postgraduate training to do? Did you go with the... Uh, oh, yes, I had a lot of postgraduate training to do after that. And, uh, and of course, uh, when uh, those of us who were in the service came back, the people who were in Boston or wherever you were training, uh, first of all, didn't even know that you'd ever come back. And second, they didn't know when you'd come back. So they, they could not really be prepared for us. And uh, when we went back, they were very generous and open and helped us. Uh, Dr. Ingram uh, said, I don't know exactly how we'll work this out, but uh, we're going to open this laboratory. And we opened it on the top floor of the old Benedict Laboratory and uh, got dogs and monkeys and cats and uh, Dr. Don Matson and I worked together for two and a half years up there. And during that time, every now and then, somebody would uh, uh, be absent in the residency, so we'd go over and fill in. And uh, then uh, he and I uh, alternated. Uh, I worked in the lab, he worked in the hospital, and vice versa. And then he went to Duke and spent a year, and I went to Toronto and spent a year in adult work because we did not have quite enough adult work at the Brigham Hospital. While you were at the Brigham, did your path cross that of Dr. Cushing at any time? Uh, Dr. Cushing had left the Brigham uh, uh, the same year I graduated from medical school, 1939, and I did not even know him. And in fact, was not uh, even intrigued by Dr. Cushing then, although I knew about him. So I did not uh, meet or have any contact with Dr. Cushing at mm -hmm. all. Uh, when you left uh, Boston, you went to Toronto. <coughs> you worked with Dr. McKenzie. Was this a, a very influential phase in your life? Or? Dr. Frank Ingram. I told Dr. Ingram uh, uh, that I was going to accept a job uh, at Wake Forest at the Bowman Gray School of Medicine. Uh, they'd offered me the job a year or so before, and, and I did not think I had had enough adult experience and I needed some. And so when he went to a meeting, uh, he talked to Dr. McKenzie. They flew back on the airplane together, and he called me in his office and said, if you go up and visit Dr. McKenzie, he's got a job for you. The job was that Charlie Drake was the resident. He dropped out for a year and did a laboratory thing. Well, I came up and took the job. And so it was a very fruitful year for me. Dr. McKenzie was uh, one of the best surgeons I've ever seen anywhere and one of the nicest people. And it was a fruitful experience for me. You followed uh, all of his patients uh, he had operated on with acoustic neuronomas. Yes, I went all over Ontario following his patients and uh, seeing the results of the hypoglossal facial anastomoses uh, those patients all had complete removals of tumors, and they all had facial paralysis. So uh, they all had hypoglossal facial anastomoses. And I remember my wife, who was not uh, medically trained, uh, uh, we went to see one man out on a farm, and uh, he was just a great result, working every day. Uh, but he had a right uh, uh, residual facial palsy with a red eye. and. Uh, as we left, I said to my wife, gee, that is a great result. And there was this silence. <laughs> and she said, what about that red eye? <laughs> so that, that's really what she saw. And uh -huh. They were good results. It was just a, it was a phase. You see, the average acoustic tumor at that time was probably four to four and a half centimeters in size. We didn't see any small acoustic tumors. Uh, and uh, so your job was to get the tumor out. You weren't worried about the facial nerve. Sometimes you, did, you were able to save it, but not often. And uh, that was a phase. The mortality, which was very high initially, Dr. Cushing used to just debulk the tumors. He'd take the tumor, soft part of the tumor out and leave the tumor capsule in. And uh, most of those patients had a, a rather tragic uh, course of increased pressure, reoperation, and so on. So Dr. McKenzie's effort was to completely remove the tumor so they didn't have any trouble with that again. And whether they had a facial paralysis or not was not of major concern, and uh, we repaired that with a, a facial, paral a facial hypoglossal anastomosis.
After you finished uh, working with Dr. McKenzie in Toronto in 1949, you then came to Winston-Salem. Well, I didn't come directly. I, I came uh, in 1948. I left there a little early and went down to, Mont to, to New Haven, where I spent several months with uh, Louise Eisenhardt, who had been Dr. Cushing's pathologist and secretary. And she was very generous and let us work. There were about four or five of us there. Uh, all of uh, us who were kind of veterans trying to catch up. And uh, after I had spent some time there, I went to Montreal and spent a month with Dr. Penfield, who was on vacation, and that was a very fruitful experience for me. And uh, then when I was 36 years old, I came to Winston-Salem. When you came to uh, Winston-Salem, uh, what sort of situation did you find here with the Bowman Gray School of Medicine? And, uh, North Carolina Baptist Hospital. Was it an active hospital? Was the neurosurgical service busy? Or? They had a neurosurgeon here uh, whose name I won't uh, mention, but he was not dependable. Uh, and he did a lot of, uh, uh, to my mind, very uh, unusual and odd things. And they wanted to get rid of him. And, and so I said, I will come if he doesn't have a part of the staff. And uh, I kept uh, telling him that, and uh, so within a month before I came, uh, I had still not uh, had a copy of a letter saying he would not admit patients anymore. And finally I called and I said, well, I'm not coming because you haven't sent me a letter. So I got the letter, and of course he was not particularly friendly to me after that. But uh, anyway, I began to build a service then. Dr. Ames was here finishing, he, although Dr. Uh, the job doctor who was here did not have his board qualifications. He did have people in training. It was very informal at that time. And so when I uh, took on Dr. Ames, who was uh, here before, he was obviously a very good person. And I trained him uh, for a year. And then uh, after that, I got my boards. And the board was perfectly happy about this and had accepted my word and let him take his boards after that. So he's, he was board certified. What type of neurosurgery, what constituted neurosurgery in 1949? That was just seven years after the famous article about uh, lumbar discs. Were you doing lumbar discs in those days? A lot, a lot of lumbar discs. Uh, we were doing all of them. The orthopedists didn't have any part in it. Uh, were you we, doing frontal lobotomies at that time? We were doing a few frontal lobotomies. I was very uncomfortable about those, but uh, there was no single medication for psychiatric disease at that time. Just like there was no single d a drug for hypertension. So we were doing a few prefrontal lobotomies, mostly done after I had spent a lot of time with each patient and decided that was the thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I think I did maybe 15. Were you doing sympathectomies or anything like I that did a, for hypertension? A lot of sympathectomies for hypertension, thoracolumbar sympathectomies, one side and then the other, uh, for people with malignant hypertension. And then uh, I was doing sympathectomies for peripheral vascular disease too. Uh, and uh, were you doing much trauma at that time? There was a lot of trauma. Uh, and of course, uh, we hadn't even at that time started doing angiograms uh, on the routine patients to see whether they had hematomas or not. How were you evaluating them? Well, we examined them and spent time with them and did burr holes. Spent a lot of time at night doing burr holes. And uh, did three burr holes on each side. And sometimes when you weren't sure that you'd covered everything, you'd tap a ventricle and put some air in and take the patient to the x-ray department and go see if there was any shift. You Were you doing burr holes in the emergency room or were you no. taking them up to surgery and doing them? No, to surgery. Mm -hmm. And were you just covering one hospital here in Winston-Salem no. or were you covering the other I, hospital too? I was uh, concerned that the South had not uh, integrated at that time and uh, I wanted to take care of the black population and so there was a black hospital here with 27 black physicians and I covered that hospital. I uh, operated there, uh, and then uh, the city hospital was a white hospital, uh, but the person who preceded me was not very dependable. He would go away for a week or two at a time, 
So they asked me to cover them, and I did cover them. So sometimes I'd have as many as 10 or 15 patients in those hospitals, not usually the sick people like I had here, but only when I had a, a very interesting or important case would I take a resident to the, those hospitals to operate. Were you inundated with uh, applications for residency here since you was a new program, or no. how did that work out? There were not really very many people going into neurosurgery at that time. Uh, in fact, uh, just a few years before that, maybe eight or ten years, Dr. Sachs was writing Dr. Cushing from St. Louis to Boston saying, have you got anybody who's interested in neurosurgery? It was not a popular thing. There were not a lot of residents. And uh, in fact, uh, I felt very sad, very uh, pleased that uh, such good people did come with me. But uh, there wasn't any great number. And in fact, I was not inundated with work at first. Uh, I went, uh, I took a lot of calls from various places all around the community. I would go to other places to see patients because I wanted them to see that I was not a Siamese twin or something and uh, some peculiar person. And uh, so I made a lot of friends in all the surrounding areas, traveled as much as 150, 200 miles and then see patients and came back. If I, if I had to do something, I, I rarely operated at the other hospitals, rarely. But I carried along enough uh, equipment, like uh, a little drill to do a twist drill hole if I needed to, or a, a formula for tube feeding if it was an unconscious patient, or try to satisfy as much as I could for the needs of the patient. How many residents have you uh, trained uh, during your years here in Winston-Salem? Well, I overlapped a little bit with uh, when Dr. Kelly took over, but I think there were about 32 or three. Mm -hmm. Well, during those years, I'm sure you've had a lot of time to think, uh, what qualifications do you look for in a person? Or how did you decide which people could make it through the program? Or who would succeed and who would not succeed? What is it that you're looking for when you picked a person? Uh, my feeling was that I was uh, 35 to 40 years old, and I'd met a lot of people in my life. and. Uh, I didn't think it took me forever to judge what kind of people they were. And although I didn't have any standard questions to ask them, I obviously wanted them to be honest and have high integrity and to be, uh, to be uh, technically proficient. One of the residents uh, jokingly accused me. I had a, a Thunderbird, a 1957 Thunderbird. And in it, I had uh, war surplus uh, seat belts with a quick release. And uh, so when I took these people out to lunch, I would uh, show them how to put that seat belt on. <laughs> and when we got through with lunch and went out, uh, if he couldn't put the seat belt on himself, I thought that was kind of a sorry display of technical ability. <laughs> uh, however, that's only an apocryphal story. Well. Uh, it you also were very concerned about their family. I, I remember you always made a point of having their wives come down and, uh, and made inquiries about their family. Did you feel that from the very beginning that it was important that uh, people have their family life sort of squared away or settled down? Oh, I, uh, I felt that was very important. That a, a, an individual had to have that aspect of his life uh, in, in control. Uh, he, uh, they were, these individuals were almost all married uh, to wonderful people and first of all I enjoyed uh, knowing all these families and secondly being a part of them and thirdly uh, I thought it was very important if they were going to be uh, trained and be able to do this that these people be part of it because life doesn't just stop when you finish being a resident. They've got to know how tough it is from then on. Uh, do you have any particular memorable anecdotes about any of the residents or any of the things that uh, you remember through the years? I remember at the, uh, the dinner in Boston, I uh, found it quite humorous about um, Dr. Ashby uh, and, and Dr. Mitchell. Uh, Dr. Mitchell seemed to always 
take the brunt of criticism for Dr. Ashby, who was just a temporary resident here. Uh, Dr. Know? Ashby came over here. I, I was uh, uh, interested in letting people rotate through other services. It was easier then. And so some of my people went other places for six months or so, and I would change with them. And Dr. Ashby changed with somebody. He was from Vanderbilt, and uh, he was a very interesting, interesting uh, humorous person. I remember, though, that he was a big person, big hands, and I used this fine uh, 4 0 cat gut. And uh, so I had him tying these knots as we closed up a wound, and he broke four or five of them, and he said, Dr. Alexander, you're just going to have to call Dr. Meacham and tell him that I cannot tie 4 old cat <laughs> <laughs> uh, In addition to your uh, experiences with uh, the residents and the training program, you've spent a great uh, number of years editing articles and working with journals. You spent a number of years with the neurosurgical techniques, and you spent a number of years with the Journal of Neurosurgery, and now you've spent at least 10 or, 10 or more years with surgical neurology. Um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about what it is that makes a good article, why some articles are accepted and some articles are rejected, and uh, if you have any thoughts that you'd like to share with people who might be viewing this about writing articles. Uh, first of all, one must have something to say uh, I think uh, uh, the present day, more than it was at that time, many people feel it's important for them to get publications on their resume so they get credit for that for promotion. And I never felt that was of any uh, significance. I think if somebody has something to say, uh, he's got to have a valid case, he's got to have good illustrations, uh, and he's got to uh, have looked up the literature and to be very sure of the cases. For example, if, if you're going to survey 35 or 40 different cases, my feeling was, and I did this myself, that you need to see every single case or the x-rays or the operative note. You've got to go over every case so you know they fall into that category. And, uh, and then, of course, you've got to be able to write. Uh, you've got to be prepared to, if your co-authors want to do something, uh, uh, you've got to be prepared to accept their suggestions. And I learned that very quickly when I was at the uh, Brigham uh, and uh, Children's Hospital with Don Matson, who was a, a genius, a classmate of mine. We were fellow house officers. But Don Matson had the capacity to write the first time, write. In other words, when he wrote something, he, you hardly ever saw any corrections on his paper or any writing between the lines or up and down. As contrasted to, say, Dr. Cushing, who wrote uh, and manuscripts and over and over again revised them right up to the time he sent them off for publication. And so I learned from Matson to accept uh, his skills with this. I would write a paper and say, what do you think about this, uh, Don? And uh, first thing I know, he'd uh, rewritten the paper better, you know. And it, it, some people just have that ability. And I, I work hard on it. I, it doesn't come easy for me. Have you any thoughts as to what the most memorable event was for you in neurosurgery? I realize that's a difficult question, but is, does any one particular event stand out more than others in, during your long career in neurosurgery? I think that would be a very difficult thing uh, to uh, recount. Uh, there have been so many outstanding events that have uh, made me happy and some of them sad. Uh, my. Uh, uh, the growth of our family. Betty and I were married almost 10 years before we had any children, and then to watch those children develop, mostly under her guidance, uh, because I was uh, working a lot. Uh, but that has been a, a truly uh, uh, outstanding and satisfying uh, part of my life. As far as any great events are concerned, uh, there have been a lot of lucky things that have happened to me. And one I remember in particular, 
Dr. Chamberlain was a neuroradiologist. They called him a radiologist at that time, but he was from uh, uh, Philadelphia, and he had been on the, uh, at that time, the Cushing Society, which was then the WNS, had all kinds of neuroscientists in it, uh, including neurophysiologists, neurochemists, neuro uh, uh, radiologists, and Dr. Uh, Chamberlain was a, uh, uh, a neuroradiologist, and he was on the board of directors of the Cushing Society. And uh, when he uh, got off of that, he resigned from that because he said, this is getting too much to be uh, a neurosurgical society. I ought to get off of this because I have other things to do. And so he was at a hotel, I think we were down in Florida, at Hollywood, Florida, and he resigned from this board. And one of the members of the board came out of the room and grabbed my arm and said, hey, we need to have you go on the board. <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't know whether that was just happenstance or whether they'd ever given it a thought or not. But anyway, that was the beginning of my involvement in uh, organized uh, neurosurgery. And I served on that to board for a year, and then I became uh, treasurer, then I became secretary, and uh, it's, it's been a gratifying time for me. I've enjoyed it. Well, besides your professional life, uh, you've been very active in the community. For example, I remember when I was here, you, uh, I always was admired the paraplegic club, or the club for the handicap that you had, plus you were recognized by Hadassah as a man of the year, and you were also active in your church, the Rotary Club. How do you find time uh, to be so active in the community when you've been so busy with your professional life? I think most people do what they want to do. And uh, I have given time to the community because of, and this is partly, uh, partly the responsibility of my wife who felt that although we had a lot of friends in medicine and intended to keep those friends, our our uh, interest in the community needed to spread beyond that. We needed to have a lot of friends who were not physicians, not scientists. And so she, is, uh, in, she has helped in that a great deal. But I did uh, join the Rotary Club. Uh, I did become president of that. Uh, I was uh, active in the Seminary Church uh, and uh, enjoyed it very much. And. Uh, the reason for my interest in the paraplegia was that we had so many paraplegic patients. They all came to us. Uh, people hurt, uh, made para paralysis, paralyzed uh, by accidents all over the state came here. And uh, so we had a lot of them. And so I, I saw these people needed help. And after my experience in Toronto with Dr. McKenzie and Dr. Harry Bottrell, who was uh, with him, I uh, formed a paraplegic association, and it met every month all over this part of North Carolina. And they did a great deal. They uh, helped one another. They all had hand controls in their cars. They all learned how to get in and out of cars. They all got all the, the houses modified. And then they went about getting every building that was built in North Carolina built so they could have an entrance to it. And then they went to the legislature and had them pass laws of access. So they were very active in this. Of course, a lot was going on at that time. Mm -hmm. You might be interested to know that they built Wake Forest uh, University here in 1954, 55, 56. And so I was very interested in that. And I sent the architect, Mr. Larson, all the specifications for access of handicapped people. And he wrote me a letter and thanked me for it. But they could not have put more barriers in the way of the handicapped. <laughs> On the other hand, I sent the same material to Mr. Neal, who was the guiding light for the St. Andrews College down at Laurenburg. And they built that college so it's a model for handicapped to this day. And of course, it's cost Wake Forest a great deal of money to alter their buildings, put elevators in, and put access ramps, and all kinds of things they still haven't gotten done. And many schools, like University of North Carolina, where some of the buildings are 150 years old, 
they can never get all those accessible. I want to uh, go back to your, your family. You were talking about your family before. Uh, you have, want to bring us up to date as to where your children are, what they've well, done, and where uh, they are in life? Our daughter, Jeannie, uh, uh, is the oldest, and she was born in 1951, so she's 42 or 3. Uh, she is an Air United Airlines stewardess, has been for 20 years. Um, she's a very bright girl, but she didn't like to go to college and wouldn't hear to getting much education, but she's read a whole lot. She's very bright and good, good person. She lives in New Jersey. Our second child was Eben Alexander III, my son, and he's a neurosurgeon, trained at Duke and trained uh, in Boston uh, with Peter Black and the uh, Nick Service, and is now at the Peter Ben Brigham Hospital as neurosurgeon there. Uh, Betsy is uh, uh, the third uh, child, and uh, she's, uh, I think, 38. She's a uh, uh, gourmet food uh, distributor. Uh, manufacturer's representative down in Charlotte doing very well. And Phyllis is uh, the youngest and uh, she's in, living in Boston, married, has a new child, a little less a year old. We have two grandchildren now, one for Alec and one for Phyllis. Mm -hmm. And your wife, is, Betty, has been, when I was a resident here, she was very much involved with all the residents and she knew their wives very well and everyone felt that they could call upon her. Uh, throughout the years, and she's been certainly a great deal of help to you. She really has, and as a matter of fact, it went beyond that because I was also chief of staff for the hospital, and we used to have a house officer's party in our backyard uh, on uh, Georgia Avenue every year until it became too large to encompass it. Well, as you are getting ready to relinquish your job as editor of surgical neurology, and as you approach 80 years of age, you find yourself for the first time in your life prospect of being unemployed. Besides catching squirrels in your backyard, uh, have you any thoughts as to what you're going to be doing with yourself? Well, uh, I'm looking for another job, but the job I do have already is as historian of the Society of Neurological Surgeons, which is the oldest neurosurgical society in the world. And uh, it publishes a uh, book about every 10 years. And this book will be published in 1995 with a biography and a photograph of every single member, dead or alive, uh, of which there'll be about 300 or 350. And uh, if you think getting all that material is easy, you, you know, you haven't done it. It's uh, going to be a lot of resistance. But I did that once before in 1943. And it came down to a list of about 12 or 13 people that I just couldn't get an answer from. And I really hit upon a good answer, and that was to call their wives at home and say, do you want to have your husband's picture in this book? And they say, yes. And I said, well, the closing date is day after tomorrow. So talk to him and write down and scribble in what he says about himself. And go to the mantelpiece and take a picture off of the mantelpiece and send it to me with the written part and uh, send it Federal Express. And I got them all. Well, wow, very good. We have, th throughout this discussion today, we have talked about your past and we've talked about uh, the history of neurosurgery at the Bowman Gray School of Medicine. I'd like to change the focus of our conversation now and have you look into the crystal ball and let's talk about the future of health care. Specifically, I'd like to discuss health care reform, the health care crisis, and the various uh, remedies that are being proposed in the, for health care delivery system. One of the things that's interested me always, as you will well remember when you're a resident, was how you treat the patients, whether you're doing the right thing for that patient or not. And uh, <clears throat> so I've been interested in uh, ethics, uh, the k medical ethics. Uh, ethics is a philosophical subject, 
and uh, it was just about at a low level of uh, pro progress until medical ethics came along and it saved the day. So it's a very, very important subject now. And I've been deeply involved in that in my uh, teaching here the last 10 years. And in fact, I formed an ethics committee and have been chairman of the Medical Center Ethics Committee for about six years. I'm not now, but I've really had a, a lot of interest in it. One of the things that interests me is that the computer and the uh, free communication and the availability of data have uh, made things so available to us that many people are rising up on their uh, hind legs and saying things in a hyperbolic way that make it make you think they know what they're talking about. Uh, for example, all of a sudden they say, do you realize that 6% uh, of all the people that get Medicare, Medicare benefits, use 30% of all the money in Medicare in the last month of their life? Well, that's frightening experience. Well, it, it is true. A lot of people have had their lives prolonged and not necessarily the way they wanted it. So that's a lesson. That's something that people learn and doctors uh, maybe change their way of handling things. They talk to patients. They, patients understand a little better uh, what they're being, uh, they're having done to them and what they can have done to them. This is the greatest country in the world. There's no argument about that. Everybody in the world wants to be here. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have to, so many people applying for citizenship. But we have to be uh, careful about this because uh, uh, it is a great country, but uh, we need to be able to look at the subject from our own point of perspective not just selfishly, because almost anything that we develop that's going to be good for patients can be transported immediately to Africa or Asia or anywhere else if we do it. So what is happening? Well, um, every field you talk about, whether it be neurosurgery or urology or orthopedics or uh, any field uh, of this sort, the progress is astonishing. In other words, look at what they do to a knee now. Uh, somebody in football uh, injury, they operate on his knee the next day and about two weeks later he's act back playing again. Uh, look at uh, what neurosurgeons have done about the spine and ruptured discs, sending people back to, uh, to work. Uh, and look at the progress that's been made about tumors and trauma and all the various aspects of it. There are many discouraging things, and that's okay. We, we, we're a bright country, and we need to, we need to look at these problems as we, as we best can. People are frightened to death about the fact that, uh, uh, that uh, the population of people over 70 was, uh, say, 5% in 1940, and here it's going to be 13% in, in by the turn of the century. Well, there are a lot of people older, a lot of people more useful than they ever were before, and a lot of handicapped people. But uh, then they make these fantastic statements that this is only a service industry, you're not making a product, you're not like building an automobile or building a toaster or something like that, you're simply making people well, as if that were pejorative, not a good thing. So I think we need to talk these things out and uh, uh, have everybody enter into it and uh, not to uh, have everybody in his small way stand up and make a, a hyperbolic statement that this is going to bring us into rack and ruin. Uh, for example, the genetics of things, you know, the fact that they could take a bacterium, E. coli bacterium, and make growth hormone out of it. Growth hormone. They could take a child and, who's uh, four feet tall and make him 
uh, five feet tall, you know. It's, it's, and so what's the problem with that? Well, first thing you know, somebody wants her son to be seven feet tall because she wants him to be a good basketball player. So she buys this drug. Well, that's an unethical thing to do. It's not good for the boy. It's not good for medicine. It's not good for... Them. So these, everything you do, everything you do brings about problems. In 1972, we learned how to put, uh, how to do dialysis. Before that, we learned how to put the endotracheal tube down. Then we learned that we didn't have to let people die right then. You could keep them alive. And how would you keep them alive? You keep them alive so they could have kidney transplants. So immediately we raised a whole lot of other problems. The hospital said, well, look, it's costing us $30,000 every time you bring somebody in on a tube who's going to die and transplant a kidney is costing us $30,000. Of course, this is another problem. It's a problem, and these are problems. We just need to all sit down and think about how we can get settled. I don't think the cost, I think the cost of medical care is far out of control, uh, but it's not necessarily uh, an individual fault. It's not the doctor's fault, except that the doctors have been short-changed, short-circuited, I should say, so much that they do not know all the charges a patient has when he leaves the hospital. He doesn't know an aspirin tablet costs two dollars um, and uh, that a pacemaker probably costs uh, twelve thousand dollars, where it used to cost three thousand dollars. And uh, so I think the physicians need to know what all the costs are. The most rapidly expanding part of graduation in the healthcare industry is administrators now. There are more administrators of various kinds graduating and becoming qualified uh, for healthcare administration than any other field, any other part of the healthcare system. So I don't look at it as a hopeless thing. I, don't, I think medicine got the brightest future we ever had. Very likely we won't be curing brain tumors with uh, chemotherapy or even with radiation therapy, no matter how concentrated it is. But very likely we'll be changing the genes. As you know, the cost of graduate medical education is very expensive. At the present time, the government is cutting back on the funding of graduate medical education, but yet uh, when the residents spend six or seven years acquiring neurosurgical training, uh, they will then enter a managed care system where they'll be on a salary, and uh, it will take a long time for them to pay back their debts. I was wondering if you had any thoughts as to how the graduate medical education should be funded in an equitable manner to all. I've heard all the Cassandras uh talking about this and I believe that the alterations that come about with this will be slow and progressive and they are not about to let the uh, product of uh, we've got of uh, good physicians in all fields uh, fall apart but it is likely that there'll be a change in the uh, remuneration uh, when I came here in 1949, uh, I had a debt of $8,000. Probably doesn't seem like very much, but it was quite a lot then. And so it's not the first time people have had indebtedness. It took me three and a half years to pay that back. And uh, so I think people will have some uh, problems in that regard. Uh, it depends on how anxious they are to do whatever they want to do. Um, the uh, model that comes to mind in uh, uh, medical schools, for example, is that uh, there's a certain uh, cap on income in the sense that if you make a certain amount, then anything above that, the next $10,000 is a 10% tax and 30% and so on, uh, depending on uh, what the level is. But that money goes into what's called a research and development fund, and it can be used for anything, including bringing new people on the staff. 
And that's exactly what's happened here. That's one reason people have been brought on here, because they have research and development funds that have been accumulated over the years uh, from that sort of a effort. Now, some institutions don't have that. Uh, they've all developed different systems. But there are many, many problems related to these things that can be solved. People were so much in favor of the Canadian system. We need a Canadian type single payer system. First of all, they don't have a single payer system in Canada. They have all kinds of provincial different uh, uh, insurance groups. Secondly, the Canadians pay twice as much income tax as we pay, and we pay twice as much health benefits. So it evens out in that regard. And the Canadians, believe me, are very well off because 90% of all Canadians live within 100 miles of the American border. And so if they want to get some expensive procedure done, many of them come to Buffalo or New York or Seattle or whatever. And uh, they borrow things from us, and rightly so. I'm a, I'm a half Canadian myself. I'm not against it. But uh, if a very good uh, nuclear physicist wants to go to Canada, he can go and spend a year or two years, and they can borrow him and, and uh, develop uh, all kinds of uh, new things. So uh, it's not a better system than ours. We just are too expensive. And, and I think we need to, uh, we need to have our best minds to think about these uh, problems, and they are. There are many people writing. If you, if you read the New England Journal of Medicine week after week after week, you'll think you're reading a different journal every week. And in fact, this week, uh, there was an editorial by the uh, president of the Massachusetts Medical Society who criticizing the main editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine of a month before by the uh, deputy editor saying this editorial shows how little control the Massachusetts Medical Society has over the New England Journal of Medicine because Marcy Angel simply said things that they didn't approve of. Well, this is okay. This is democratic. This is uh, nobody got mad. It's just democratic system of discussing these things. And that's what we need right now. Every little group needs to discuss this. There's a move on that's going on in uh, many communities uh, to, uh, do, to uh, replace the private practitioner with group practices. Um, it um, seems to be more of a move to deliver capitated type medicine rather than fee-for-service medicine. Uh, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about this system because it seems to be it's what's, what's coming down the pike and I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. I think that the most of the younger people, and I have to classify myself certainly and probably you as not being one of the younger people now. Most of the younger people are perfectly willing to work on the salary. Some kind of negotiated adequate salary with some kind of security for a job, security for help. But every part of the country has a different problem. In North Carolina they're terribly intent on bringing family practitioners into every small community. Now that means a small community of maybe 2,000, 2,500 people. Um, the only way to get uh, the people to settle in those communities is to have them marry girls that want to go back to those small communities. Because you can't have a girl in the city who's used to all the theater and all the entertainment and all the places to eat and have her go back to a small community where she's living in a fishbowl and has to go to a certain church and has to follow a certain line of social obligations. And so what do you say? Well, those communities don't have the best lawyers, they don't have the best uh, ministers, they don't have the best businessmen, they don't have the best anything. They have good people who like to live there. Many of them go to other places to do their service. But to, to blame doctors for not serving all those communities is, to my mind, a mistake.
One of the things you're hearing coming from those uh, who are advocating change in the healthcare system is that there are too many specialists and not enough general practitioners. And one of the remedies proposed is that general specialists of all sorts be retrained to work in emergency rooms and be general practitioners and that they would come out with financial incentives to bring this about. It seems to me that it's sort of the same type of thinking as burning books, trying to stop knowledge and uh, therefore turning the clock back. I was wondering what your thoughts are on this. Well, I've, I've got a lot of thoughts about that. One is that nobody alone can do good family practice and expect to give do justice to pediatrics and obstetrics and general medicine. And furthermore, if he's alone and doesn't have anybody to uh, take a call for him at night, he just simply can't stand it. Somehow they, the government, uh, the people in Washington have the idea that we need to have generalists who covered everything and then they would allocate these people to other places. Now I've thought all the time and what we need to do was to put groups of three to six to nine to 12 people in small communities. An internist, a pediatrician, OBGYN. A surgeon would be added maybe after six. And a radiologist after nine, you know. Bring people in. They cover for each other. You say, well, how can a pediatrician cover a internist? Well, he can be there at night. If he finds something he can't handle, he can call whoever he needs to to call about it. But he's a doctor. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to reverse the tendency to have emergency rooms covered by emergency trained physicians. We had one of the first programs right here at the Baptist Hospital, one of the first in the country. In fact, we had the first, but we were getting a grant from the Bureau of State Services, which was a parallel institute for the National Institute of Health. And to save money, they obliterated that. So we didn't get that grant. Cincinnati got the grant. But anyway, we've had it a long time. And these people are ex expert. I read their journals. I read their experimental work. They got good laboratories. They're good people. Nobody's going to take back that job of training emergency medicine. But it's not hard when people go through medical school and learn as much as they learn for them to practice medicine on every scale. You know, people come in uh, sick, then they can evaluate the situation. If, even if it's an obstetrician, he can evaluate a medical problem or a pediatric problem. It's not impossible, and people just have to do that. And finally, I want to just touch on the subject of the medical liability problem. I uh, don't know that you have any yeah. answers for that, but that's, uh, it's not just limited to medicine. I mean, the liability revolution in this country is just tearing the country apart. Uh, as you know, do doctors are now practicing all sorts of defensive medicine and will get sued more than ever, even though we have the highest standard of medicine in the whole world. Uh, I don't know what the future of the liability situation is. President Clinton has promised to address this issue, but I haven't seen any specific measures. Uh, have you any? Additional thoughts on this whole subject, or well, both uh, Mr. Clinton and uh, Hillary Clinton, his wife, are uh, members of the Trial Lawyers Association in Arkansas, and they were strongly supported by them. And whether they can pull away from that or not, I don't know, because when you try to change something through the legislature, you're faced with a ma majority of attorneys many of whom are trial attorneys. I look at this as a problem that's related to about 5% of the attorneys. After all, we've got to have a country that's ruled by law. We've got to have law and order. And lawyers are important to us. They're good people. They're good friends of mine and yours. Went to college with them. I see them all the time. But uh, there's a whole bunch of people that are just out to make money and uh, do it, as you say, in the malpractice field. Uh, I think the only people that are going to settle this problem are the lawyers themselves. If they get 
uh, upset enough to say our reputation is being sullied by this group of people. It's like throwing a drunk out of a football game simply because he makes everybody look bad. And uh, these people are making uh, the world and making the legal profession look bad. And they are. They're, the people are having to practice uh, defensive medicine. As far as I personally is concerned, uh, I never paid out a dime. Uh, I never had a, a hearing for a malpractice case. But I did have a case I operated on for one of the residents. And so uh, the patient didn't get along very well. She said, I'm going to sue somebody. And so she sued me. And uh, so I sent the information to her, uh, my attorney. And about six months later, he called back and said, you're not going to like this. And I said, what's that? He said, well, her lawyer said that uh, he's investigated you in this case. And she does not have a case. And he's not going to pursue it. But he sent her a bill for $8,000 $8, for that service. And she says that if he charges her $8,000, she's going to make him pursue the case or else charge him with malpractice. And so the t insurance company said, we would like to pay him $8,000 to settle the case. Otherwise, it'll cost us $100,000 to run through the courts. And so I talked to all the lawyers I knew about it, and all of them said I was naive and didn't understand the problem, and that they should pay it, which they eventually did. That's the only. But as far as any other case is concerned, I do not testify or even get information for plaintiffs. Now, that, that could be a, a disservice to the plaintiffs, but I tell them that if the a physician who's being sued will call me, I will investigate the case on my own for nothing. I don't send him any bill. If I don't think he has a defense, I will tell him so. I will not write anything down. I will not make any tapes of it. And therefore, I'm not discoverable. But he should be, on my advice at least, he should be able to settle it for whatever it has to do. And that's the way I've handled all of them. Well, I think we've run out of all my questions here. Uh, I think now we can conclude our conversation and get on with the other festivities to celebrate your 80th birthday. Thank you, Dr. Krishna, very much. <laughs>